Welcome. Uh, so uh, we, we have a lot of people from the uh, attending the summit who are uh, fairly new to the project. And we find out that like, Zen is a very old project. It's been like 20 years in the public now. Um, and there's just a long, long history. There's a lot of different areas, a lot of different use cases, a lot of different people doing stuff. And when you come to the project like that, there's often, you know, you say, what does this mean? And then someone answers the question in terms of like something else you also don't understand. Um, so my goal for this talk is uh, so that for you to have the brief idea of the total architecture of Zem, some of its key capabilities um, and some distinctive strengths. I want you to understand how it has been used so you can have an idea, I mean, if you could use it, but also other areas in which you might be able to use it. Um, I want to know what you know who is using it and also who's contributing to it, so you know kind of the major players in the space. Um, and also a little bit about, about the, pro the uh, project governance. And so what we're going to do is we're going to briefly take a whirlwind tour through um, the, uh, uh, the history of Zen, um, stopping at each point to then talk about um, how things are right now, as it were. I'm not going to talk about the whole development of, of server virtualization, for instance, but when we get there, we're going to talk about how it is right now. Uh, so origins, virtualization in 2002. So VMware had come onto the scene in 1998. Server virtualization had kind of taken the world by storm. Uh, but on x86, the only way to do, the only really efficient way to do um, uh, virtualization was a technique called binary translation. So um, binary translation was very, very complicated. Um, it was not very fast, and there were no competitive open source implementations. So into this uh, area came the Xenos Cambridge Xenoservice project. So the original idea for the Xenoservice project actually was what, you, what, we, what we might call now a distributed cloud. Okay, so remember back in the day, laptops were a lot less uh, frequent. Everyone had like a computer sitting under their desk at home, and many people would run SETI at home or folding at home or something like that to essentially donate sparse CPU cycles from their computers to look for aliens or you know whatever it was. Um, so the idea was, could we have people actually sell their CPU cycles at home I instead to um, to companies, to um, academic institutions that need to do sort of, you know, uh, big simulations or, or whatever. So the challenge they had was, so how do we um, run untrusted arbitrary code? And specifically, they said, how can we run code um, with the highest level of compatibility? We don't want to have to have people write uh, code that will only run on this system. We want to be able to write code that will run anywhere um, and then run, run on the thing. So basically, so basically we want to be able to run Linux um, on the system at your thing at home. So if you're going to do that, obviously you need uh, virtualization. So this is where the uh, idea of Zen from, was born. Now, the key idea that, that they had for Zen was something called para-virtualization. So in binary translation, so you have a, uh, the guest operating system is a piece of software, and the hypervisor is a piece of software. Um, they're talking to each other over, um, but the interface they're talking to each other is a hardware interface, right? So they said, why don't we just, um, tell the guest operating system, you're not running on real hardware, you're running um, in a virtual machine. If you need to modify your page tables, make this hypercall. If you need to modify you know, this or that other privileged operation, do this hypercall. Um, uh, so throw away everything that doesn't work and um, you know, make it a software-based interface. So the other, th the other thing that has had a major impact on the way that Zen has been thought about and designed is what I will call a practical microkernel. So microkernels were, um, you know, sort of came into to play. They were sort of proposed in the early 90s. Um, and by the 2000s, like most op operating system researchers were kind of sick of the microkernels, right? Um, but one of the things about the microkernels was they were very kind of ideologically driven. They're like, let's make everything as tiny as possible, okay? Or, or to say, um, you know, we'll have one interface that everything will be designed off of, off of that, right? So Zen's is a microkernel in the sense that, like, th as they say, we want Zen to be a small thing and, and we want to push things out and, like, have things be able to be broken down and, and these sorts of things. But we be practical about it, okay? If it makes sense to put in Zen, we'll put it in Zen. If it makes sense to put outside of Zen, we'll put it outside of Zen, right? So um, that has really been uh, the practical microkernel thing, we'll, we'll see, has had a pretty big impact on how Zen's been able to, to do. So from the very beginning, there have been primitives that allow different VMs to talk to each other, okay? Event channels and grants, which um, events channels to signal to each other, and grants to allow for um, you know, controlled inter-domain memory sharing. So basic Zen architecture. Uh, so we have, as we said, Zen runs right on the bare hardware. It controls the CPU, the memory, and the um, interrupts. 
it does not run the uh, device drivers. So the first thing you do in a typical Zen system, and this is a, again a typical system, you start up it runs a domain. A, so a domain, an instance of a running virtual machine on Zen is called a domain. So uh, we have the first domain that started is called domain zero. It will typically have the devices for the whole system um, and the tool stack and uh, in a PV system, so we have the, DOM, the, 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 the unprivileged domain, or a DOM U. Um, so it's using hypercalls to talk to Zen to do the privileged operations. And for device drivers, it has basically a shared memory ring between um, uh, domain zero. So we have the front end driver in DOM U, and the back end driver in DOM zero, which provides the, 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 the interface. Now, and here's where the you know we have a, a, a Zen distinctive um, where we get some of the privileged um, you know you know the practical microkernel approach right so the typically the device drivers are in DOM zero but they don't have to be so one thing you can do is to have say um, a device a, a, a driver domain right you can have a separate domain which has access to a specific device in this case sort of we have a DOM net so a, a network domain it has access to this NIC. Um, the device driver for that NIC is running inside that domain, um, and then it's providing the backend for the for the DOM use. Now, the advantage there's two advantages of this. First of all, um, a resiliency. So, device drivers sometimes crash. At some point, it was determined that you know device drivers were like some super high percentage of the of the number of, of crashes of Windows were actually to do with the device drivers. Um, so. If your network device driver crashes and it's in DOM zero, your whole system is basically toast. If your network driver um, device driver crashes and it's in DOM U, you can restart the uh, you can restart the the, the domain and and keep going. Um, it also increases the security uh, because you know things have bugs. Um, the not only the, the there might be bugs in the backend driver um, that allow you to to break in. There also might be bugs in the network stack somewhere, IP tables or or so on. Um, if all that's running in domain zero. And you get control into that, right? You now have control of the kernel of domain zero, which basically means you have control of the whole system. Um, if you, uh, on the other hand, if you break into the the kernel of the network driver domain, I mean, you get a little bit more. You can try and attack other guests. You can have a control of the network card, which is not nothing. But it's not nearly. You're not there yet. You just need to do something else to break into the rest of the system. Um, so obviously, the first uh, use case that we did for was for server virtualization. Um, so in this area, basically, there's two kind of uh, major ways that this is used. So the first would be sort of virtualization appliance, um, like uh, Zen Server, come by the Zen Server CSG, um, and also XCPNG, uh, which is primarily uh, you know, developed by Vates. Um, <clears throat> and of course, it's available in a lot of distros. So SLES, Ubuntu, Debian, um, all monarchy Linux, uh, Fedora, and so on. Um, Zusa are major contributors. Uh, and um, we have active package managers who, from you know Fedora, Debian, and Omen Arch and Linux, who you know hang on our RC channels and, and, and interact with us from time to time. So the next big thing that happened is in 2004, um, hardware virtualization came out. So basically, this is Intel VTX and AMD SVM. So this made virtualizing the CPU a lot easier. We didn't have to have the whole thing with per virtualized, you know, hypercalls and so on. Um, all that could be done in hardware. Um, this made it now possible to run unmodified guests. But unmodified guests on x86 are also expecting not just to be able to sort of you know, write to the, you know, the hardware registers, but they're expecting to have um, a BIOS and a motherboard and um, you know, it, you know, certain kinds of physical devices that, that a system might have. Um, so that's not the kind of thing that you know, Zen, the Zen people wanted to do virtualization. We didn't want to do like, you know, emulating devices. So luckily, there was another project called QMU, and they loved the idea of emulating devices. And so we just took their code and used that as to emulate um, all the devices that we need to run a fully virtualized system. And so the HVM domain type was born. So before, we only had one domain type, pair virtualized. Now we have two types, right, PV and HVM. Uh, so so yeah, so in this case, you know, so DOMU, the, the CPU stuff runs directly on Zen and mostly is 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 um, uh, the, the, the CPU is, is virtualized by, with the um, hardware virtualization extensions. Um, but the uh, devices have to be emulated by QMU, typically running in domain zero. And again, we have the, you know, the, the practical micro microkernel approach. Um, 
we it's possible to run a device model stub domain. So this is what we call it, a stub domain. So a stub domain runs exactly one thing. So in this case, we have um, QME, rather than running a QME and DOM0, we have the same problem with QME and DOM0 as we have with the device drivers, OK? So QME is, is, may have bugs. If, you can, if an attacker can break from the, um, the untrusted domain, into QMU, now it has access to user space inside of DOM0, which is not as good as the kernel in DOM0, but it's still much easier to attack DOM0 and the rest of the system from user space in DOM0 than it is from, from elsewhere. So with um, stub domains, you can um, you run QMU in a separate domain. And this domain only has privilege over exactly one other domain. Um, and uh, if you manage to break into it, then again, you, you don't really get, get that much more. One of the things to notice about this is that then, in this case, the, um, the kernel is kind of a dotted line because uh, what we did with that is um, rather than have a full-fledged Linux system to run just a single process, um, we did some, used something called MiniOS. So um, MiniOS was basically just, not, just a tiny amount of a wrapper. So we had um, a libc. Normally, you have a libc which will make system calls on your behalf. In this case, we had the libc make a function call into a what you might call a library OS. So it's a minimal kernel that just um, implements enough of the functionality to allow the libc to allow uh, a guest to QME guest to run top of it. Um, and then we would generalize this to say um, an idea of maybe sometimes it's called library OS, sometimes it's called a unit kernel, basically. Um, examples of this can be uh, Mirage, uh, OSV, which is another a startup company that was made to actually make money off this idea, um, and Unicraft. Um, in 2006, we had the Amazon public cloud. They went public, public with their first public cloud. Um, and of course, this made the major, uh, Zen is still a major player um, in, uh, in public cloud space. So um, you, you, know that you may have heard that Amazon has their own um, hypervisor Nitro now, but they still have millions of instances of, of, Zen, of, of systems running on Zen. Um, Rackspace and IBM Software both use Zen Server. Um, you know, Gandhi.net and Paperspace use um, Zen. And there's a long tail of others as well. Um, so people from the space who contribute strongly to Zen, so Amazon, Amazon doesn't really contribute a lot of code per se, but they've always contributed financially, and they've also always contributed kind of um, behind the scenes in a lot of other ways, particularly in the, in the security arena. Um, Rackspace also contributes. They don't. They they mean they they, they they don't contribute a lot of money, but they contribute a lot of their um, uh, sort of free you know virtualization things for our infrastructure and so on. Another thing that happened in um, 2009 uh, was the idea of client virtualization. Um, so <clears throat> it's not only on servers that you want to be able to separate different kinds of workloads. Individuals um, where you have the same person also may want to separate different kinds of workloads. Uh, so the primary use case for this for, um, you know, so Citrix came up with, uh, slash ZenSource came up with this project called um, Zen Client. And the original idea with that is, um, you know, if you have a corporate laptop, the IT department can make a work VM and locked out that completely. Like you can't install anything, like really restrictive policies about you know, what, what sites you can visit and so on. But you can have a personal VM where sort of if you're traveling, if you're at a conference like this, um, you know, so right now I have my corporate laptop here and I have my personal laptop um, in, in my bag as well. It's because I want to be able to do both things. Um, what Zen Client was targeted to allow you to do is to say, you just being one laptop, um, the corporate laptop can be completely locked down. We're sure that, you know, pretty sure that's not going to be um, you know, infiltrated in any way. The personal laptop, if you get stuff or whatever on there, that's kind of your problem. It doesn't affect the, the corporation as much. Um, so in general, um, so client virtualization solutions we have now, two really major ones. So the first is um, Cubes OS. Cubes OS uses uh, device drivers and stub domains. Um, waiting for the uh, Marek to contradict me there. Um, <laughs> they, been, they contribute a lot of stuff to you know, projects like Trench Boot, um, Dynamic Reader Trust, um, and so on. And it's used by many different people like you know, people who want the extra labor security. So you, you can have your banking VM in one VM, a normal VM in, in, in a di different VM. And if you go to websites that are kind of untrustworthy, you put that in a different VM, right? So you have a certain level of, of, of way to isolate your, different, your own different things in your life to make sure that um, people, uh, it's more difficult for people to attack you. Um, and the major contrib contributor for this is Invisible Things Labs. And there's the OpenXT project. Um, the OpenXT project is the basically, at some point, uh, uh, Citrix open sourced the Zen client and kind of stopped developing it. And so now it's being developed as, as an open project. Um, uh, yeah, so it uses you know, device drivers, stub domains, and it also uses XSM. Um, 
and uh, it's used by you know the US DOD, the NSA, and a bunch of other people like that. And, and, and in this case, a lot of times what they do is basically is they have different levels of security clearance, right? So they have a VM for each different level of security clearance or each different kind of you know area of the, the doing that they need to keep um, isolated, where like 10, 20 years ago, they would have actually, actually carry four laptops. Now they can carry one laptop with four different VMs. Um, major computers to this include um, AS, Operative Systems, Starlab, um, and so on. Now, as things went along, um, the hardware visualization for uh, got better and better. So they got hardware set to paging. Um, they got uh, you know the, the ability to do direct invention injections and, and and so on. And so um, virtualization under hardware virtualization things, uh, as far as the CPU thing, kept getting kind of faster and faster. Whereas the the um, the PV interfaces weren't really kind of progressing because there was no investment in making those interfaces faster. Um, so now we had the thing. So do we go with HVM so we can have the really fast CPU um, hardware virtualization features, but bring along the baggage of having you know QMU and all these image device drivers and the slow boot and so on, or do we go with PV and have the really lightweight domain, you know, no device driver, like no image devices, you know, super fast boot and this kind of stuff, but not have the advanced um, CPU features? And so we stepped back and we said, okay. If we were if we were going to do the idea of a, of a PV domain from scratch today. What would we do, right? How would we take advantage of the virtualization? I mean, given that the virtualization extensions actually do exist, and so thus PVH mode was born. So the idea here was that we use the hardware extensions where it makes sense to speed things up, but um, there's no need for emulated devices. The guest operating system still knows that it's running um, uh, uh, paravirtualized, and when we need to give it a paravirtualized interface, we, we just do that. Um, now that does mean x86's you know, interface is a bit more complicated. So we have Classic PV domains. We have P PV, uh, We have HVM domains, which you know uh, can boot any VM, and we have PVH domains. Um, 2011, uh, the Zen project joins the Linux Foundation. Um, so this is kind of an opportunity to step back and talk a little bit about, about governance. So originally, the governance was kind of the um, uh, benevolent dictator model. Uh, so Kier was the kind of the, the dictator as far as code goes, and Ian Pract was the kind of you know Zen master as far as like what the direction of the whole project was going. Um, they kind of, you know, at this point, sort of slowly faded away. And the um, the remaining kind of maintainers said, well, what are we going to do? Um, and decided to basically say, OK, whoever's a committer, um, they just, you know, get their, 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 that, that becomes our sort of technical advisory board, OK? The leadership of the hypervisor project is defined by who the committers are. Um, so the way we have it now is the project code is completely defined by the developers. It was developer organized. Okay, um, each of the different there's Zen project has sub projects. So the main project is the hypervisor project. That's basically everything under Zen.git, QMU, you know the Linux um, kernel drivers and so on. Um, but there's also other projects like you know Zappy, Zappy project, Windows, um, Windows PV drivers project, um, Unicraft and so on. Each of the sub projects have their own leadership team, and anyone can kind of by contributing and 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 you know uh, getting involved in the project eventually get on that leadership team. Um, and project-wide decisions are made by uh, the leadership teams of the active projects. Separately from that, there's the Zen Project Advisory Board. The Zen Project Advisory Board basically holds the purse strings, right? So this is large companies can um, you know, buy membership to the thing. And they pay for you know, the development infrastructure, the IT contractors, um, uh, public relations stuff, um, the test lab, and they majorly subsidize the, the, the Zen Summit. Um, and this is. At the moment, the way this is set up is completely separate. Okay, so you can join, you can give the money, and you have control over um, a lot of the, the the way the money is spent. Um, but the actual code is only is is still maintained only by the developers. Um, Twenty twelve. Uh, so basically, ARM, the ARM visualization extensions came out, and this basically gave Zen an opportunity to go into the you know really embedded space. So Citrix at the time. Um, as it happens, it was looking at the time like ARM servers were going to be the next big thing, um, like imminently right around the corner. And so Citrix, you know, funded a number of you know very senior developers to spend you know a year or two getting the ARM port up to speed. Um, as it happens, you know, ARM servers are taking a little bit long, longer to come. But the side effect of that is that now, um, you know, Zen works very well in the embedded space. Um, so in the you know kind of advantages for embedded kind of automotive, you know, it's slow, um, it's in small, low overhead. Um, this kind of practical microkernel approach gives you a lot of flexibility in how you kind of design, design the system. You can have very strong isolation between things and still have things kind of you know work together. Um, it is possible to safety certify 
Um, and you know, unlike other, I mean, there are other projects that that that, that have some some of the first two things. But one of the things that we have is we have a very mature, um, diverse community with you know established governance and established you know security processes and so on. So major players in this space, uh, as far as contributors, are you know ARM, EPAM, um, and AMD slash Xilinx, and then there's kind of a long tail of other people who sort of contribute as as they kind of need to. And one of the architectural things that came out of this was the idea of DOM zeroless, right? So in this case, all all the other pictures that we've had have the first thing we have is DOM zero, who boots first and you know sets up the hardware and so on. But for if you want to have a static configuration, if you don't need to, to create any VMs, if you don't need to emulate any, any any devices, then in fact what you can do is you can just hand Zen a bit of device tree code that says, just start these two VMs and hand this device to this VM and this device to this VM, and then you're done, right? And in this case, basically, it's a lot faster to boot, right? Because then just bam, pff, these these these. Uh, VMs come up really quickly. There's no need for the extra overhead of DOM0 or the, any emulation stuff like that, and there's no need to, to certify um, DOM0 in these kinds of use cases. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of things still in process. Okay, so Mistress C, um, AMD has, um, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to the, the, the move to making, um, adopting a lot of the Mistress C rules as official rules um, and documenting the deviations from them so that, like, to make it easier to, to certify. Um, you know, Hyperlaunch is taking the kind of DOM zero less idea to the next level. Um, the idea here will eventually be that we have, you know, DOM B, which is the boot domain, which will come and allow you to flexibly, programmatically, Set up whatever kind of a system you want. System you want, right? There's, you know, uh, for DOM zero less, you know, you're kind of limited in what you can express to what can be put into the device tree. Okay, the idea behind eventually the idea behind hyperlaunch um, is that uh, you'll be able to start this DOM B that will that will have you can write arbitrary code in there to set up the system way that you want, and then DOM B will go away, and you you're, you have a static system that is set up the way that you want it to. Um, you know, Vir.io, uh, a lot of this is actually kind of done already for on the ARM side, and we're moving to doing Vir.io for grants and things like that as well. Um, and there are new ports. The, the, so there's been a RISC-V port entry, which has been slowly making progress um, uh, for, you know, quite a while now. Um, and we have just, earlier this week, checked in the, first, the very first code for um, the PowerPC port. Um, so in summary, um, you know, Zen, it, we have a, it's a practical microkernel architecture with a focus on, you know, pair virtualization, again, kind of a practical pair, pair, pair virtualization. We have a mature community and a mature community process with, um, you know, diverse set of use cases and a very wide and diverse community. Um, and so with that, I will take any questions. To be online. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs>